Thaïs et Lassie. Hello. Hello. You are a speaker, screenwriter and photographer. You describe yourself as a local of Accra, Berlin, New York and Rome. And Lisbon. And Lisbon. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we'll come back on that okay. later. You gave a speech in Kaplankaya about conscious states. Um, also about feeling um, a local more than a citizen from a country. We'll talk also about uh, your previous books. Mm. To start with, um, after two world wars, we went to a relatively, I say relatively, a peaceful period. Uh, but the period is becoming uh, extremely tense again with uh, what's happening in uh, Ukraine, the tension between U the United States and China. What's happening to the world? Are we reproducing things again and again? Mm. Well, they say history repeats itself, don't they? I think reproducing things again and again has been the course of uh, international relations since its birth in 1648, um, unfortunately. I think the difference with what's happening now is that we have not just as kind of state leaders and academic thinkers the ability to reflect on the past, but as citizens and as individuals the ability to access that information via technology. And so it's difficult for me to imagine anybody reading about what's happening in the Ukraine, for example, to, to read about um, Russia invading Ukraine, to see photos of a bombed Kiev, and not to draw on the available imagery and information about the Second World War and the wars that it begat. It's difficult for me to imagine anybody reading about Iran and its crackdown on its women and girls, its murder of Masa Amini, who can't reach back easily with the click of a button and, and see what happened with the revolution and its, it, and its ultimate defeat at the end of the 70s. And so I console myself with the notion that we as a global community, aware as we are, informed as we are in ways we've never been before, may be able to stem the tide in ways we've never done before. Do you think states still represent their citizens? Do I think states still represent their citizens? Well, states are not people. A state is an idea. In order to analyze the actions of the state, we must first disaggregate it into the human beings who act in its name. And so do I think elected state leaders, do I think appointed state leaders, do I think self-appointed state leaders represent their citizens? In some cases, yes. I gave a few examples yesterday of state leaders who are doing phenomenal and human-facing things. But the fact remains that for the most part, state leaders continue to act in the interest of a ruling elite. How could they more um, represent their citizens? By listening to them. By not hiding behind um, false foes. I was thinking the other day, I was asked a question about nationalism. Why do I think nationalism is on the rise? And I was thinking about something said by the ever brilliant um, Muhammad Zafa, who said, you know, the nationalist blames the immigrant for taking his job. Yeah. But the immigrant didn't take the nationalist job. The capitalist took the nas nationalist job and gave it to the immigrant because the immigrant was in such a desperate situation that they were willing to work for less. And the capitalist's greatest joy is that the nationalist blames the immigrant instead of blaming the capitalist. What leaders could do is stop hiding behind false foes and reveal our obsession with growth economy to be the source of most of these ills. We've had wars, um, countries or not, even between uh, regions, kingdoms, neighbors, brothers. Mm. Um, is it in the human nature to want to possess, to envy, to fight? Only in the context of scarcity. So when everybody has, nobody needs to take from their brother, their kingdom, their fellow clan, their neighboring tribe. In the context of scarcity or perceived scarcity, conflict becomes um, both inevitable and endemic. But scarcity is not our lot. There is enough food right now on planet Earth to feed the human beings on the same. Now, there must be attention paid to population growth, of course, but we have what we need for who is here. The problem 
is that those who take more than they need leave those who haven't without. And I don't think that it is fair to sort of chalk up the conflict that we're facing, that we've been facing to human nature when in fact the source is human greed. Do we lack of uh, compassion? You gave um, an interesting example uh, yesterday about neuroscience. Well, I did say that human beings are not at the basic level, at the visceral level, at the neurological or visceral um, bodily level compassionate in the sense that we respond bodily and physically to the suffering of those we identify as us, but less to those we identify as them. This is, this, this is um, demonstrable. But I think it is still the case that human beings can be taught compassion and that human beings can learn empathy. The question is whether leaders who are tasked to do that kind of education are interested in, in taking up the challenge. Do we need like um, a big drama again to uh, change? Hopefully not. The big dramas of the past, two world wars, uh, a nuclear bomb dropped on Japan, decades of internecine warfare, poverty, starvation would seem to be sufficient. If human beings need more, if we need a natural disaster of global proportion, if we need epic catastrophe, I'd, I'd despair. If we found a global enemy uh, so we can identify to each other as humans, mm. such as uh, climate change or uh, potential self-extinction, uh, could it be that we would be in the same team again? You say if, but we have. Yeah, we face that common threat. But if we realize that we're in the same team, question is how? I guess that. The question is what would bring about that realization on on a global scale? And there I believe um, leaders, there I believe those with the information are responsible for trying to figure out how to convey it to those who haven't got it. So we heard a brilliant talk yesterday about extinction level threat. How do we get that kind of information? How do we distill it? How do we reduce it down to a level that the average human being, wherever he or she may live, can understand? How do we make it such that when you wake up in the morning, you see yourself first as us, the humans, us, the occupants of the globe, versus it, extinction level threat? I don't know. But as a writer and as an inveterate communicator, I do believe there is a way and I believe the time is now. So we need, uh, you say, to have conscious states. So what are exactly conscious states? So yesterday I defined conscious statecraft because I think the conscious state um, might be elusive, not least because the state itself is a concept, it's an idea. But states, of course, are run by human beings, human beings we call leaders, and they represent human beings we call citizens. So my question is, how can those human beings act in a way, how can they practice what might be called conscious statecraft? I considered yesterday that we might think of conscious statecraft as statecraft that is both responsive and self-aware, aware of the identity or the purpose of the state for those who live within its borders, and aware of the impact of the state on those who don't, so on the globe, on others, responsive to the conditions of the 21st century, responsive to global climate change, responsive to the dynamics of the present moment reality. I gave a number of examples. Can you give them, can you share them now? Like so, so some concrete, uh, can we spend some time like, yeah, coming back on this concrete uh, example that of you think, statement. yes, very sure. important, yeah. Sure, sure. I gave um, four examples of conscious statecraft yesterday practiced by the leaders of Iceland, of Finland, of Nigeria, and of Ecuador. So Iceland, um, implemented a catch limitation system, uh, decreeing by law that there were limits on the number of individual types of fish that could be caught by Icelandic fisheries. I suggested that in order to implement such a system, Icelandic leaders had to first become conscious of a different understanding of us versus them. So if us is simply the shareholders of a single Icelandic fishery, then a catch limitation system makes no sense. You would say, we are the shareholders of this one fishery, let's go out and get the fish, winners take all. If we redefine us as citizens of the Icelandic state and furthermore of their descendants, of the great-great-grandchildren of the Icelandic fishers, um, fishermen and fisherwomen who are working now, then a new 
kind of politics emerges, then we say, unless we impose catch limitation systems, we will overfish ourselves to death. So I argue that the Icelandic catch limitation system implemented by specific Icelandic human beings represents an example of conscious statecraft. Finland became the first country in the world to do away with traditional school subjects, history, math. The, the current school system practiced around the globe is based on 19th century needs and conditions. Finland becomes conscious of the fact that we live in the 21st century. We live in an interconnected global world. We live in a technological world. History, math, subjects that are not interdisciplinary, subjects that are not technology-based, are not well suited to the students of our time. Conscious of this fact, Finnish leaders changed the school curriculum, something that would have seemed impossible to imagine merely 10 or 15 years ago. Conscious statecraft. Nigeria. Nigerian leaders imposed a ban on foreign models and foreign accents in advertising. Why? Because Nigeria is a country, is a state that emerged from a British colony. Nigerian leaders became conscious of the fact that that history, that past of British colonization led to practices that harm Nigerian citizens, skin bleaching, fad dieting, low self-esteem. Nigerian leaders said, let's take action, let's implement law that protects our citizens, particularly our women, in a robust and widespread way, conscious statecraft. Ecuador, in 2008, Ecuador, at the constitutional level, recognized the rights of nature and this year recognized the rights of animals. There we see a, a group of state leaders aware not only of the internal identity of the state, its obligations to the humans within it, but the external impact of the same, its impact on nature, its impact on the environment. Ecuador, practicing staunch, uh, conscious statecraft, says, if we've got laws that protect citizens, that protect human beings, we need laws that protect animals and nature as well. This is possible, this is now, and this is necessary. What uh, can we do as individuals uh, to help? this process concretely? Well, if we're thinking about conscious statecraft, we're thinking about conscious leaders elected by conscious voters who are themselves conscious citizens. I think that what we can do and what we must do is to become conscious citizens. And I know that it's, that it's hard. I mean, if I, I said yesterday, if you're thinking about how to put food on the table or pay your mortgage or pay your heating bill, your heating bill in the winter ahead, then it's difficult to be conscious of the needs of your neighbor, of your neighborhood, of your state, of your country. Nevertheless, if we don't start thinking about who is in power and who is acting in the name of the state and therefore in the name of the globe, we face together in exactly the way that you said, as the common us, unprecedented threat, unprecedented harm. And so I think every individual can start to ask, who have I put in power? How have I used my electoral voice, assuming that they live in a democracy, to choose the people who will or will not practice conscious statecraft? Wonderful. On your TED talk, you said you wanted to be introduced uh, as a local, not as a citizen from a country. Mm. So you were born in um, London in London with a Ghana um, a father and a uh, no, Nigerian father. Nigerian mother, Ghanaian. Yeah, and Ghanaian, yeah. Uh, so why do you prefer to be described as a local uh, more than a citizen? Well, what country are you from, Rose? I'm French. You're French. So if you tell me that you're French, I know a little bit about you. Mm -hmm. I know that you're not Asian or South American, but I don't know terribly much more. Now, if I ask you a different question, if I ask you, Rose, where are you local? What cities in the world do you feel like a local? Yeah, I've just moved to Barcelona. Okay. But to be honest, I would still feel uh, more French than a local. For me, it, I wouldn't feel like, uh, I would feel it would speak more about myself to be French than uh, a have, local have from Barcelona lived? because I've just moved. Understood. Have you yeah. lived all over France or have you lived in a particular city? I've lived in Paris and gone on holiday, gone on holiday in, uh, in France. And okay. well, have you lived kids. in any other city for any prolonged period of time? Yeah, I've lived in London for uh, nine years okay. and uh, Hong Kong seven years. Okay, so I would describe you as a local of Paris, London, Hong Kong, and perhaps soon to be a local of Barcelona. Yeah. And if you tell me that, if you kind of give me a picture of your personal map, 
I know more about you. Of course. I know more uh-huh. what kind of questions yeah. to ask, what kind yeah. of, above all, what kind of things we have in common. If you tell me that you're French and I tell you in return that I carry a British and American passport and my parents, Nigerian and Ghanaian, we are stuck on either side of a divide. But if you tell me that you are a local of Paris, of London, of Hong Kong, and soon to be a local of Barcelona, I begin to imagine, oh, she's multi-local. I am too. Oh, she's a local of London. I was born there. Oh, she lives in Southern Europe. So do I. And locality tends to engender conversations about commonality, whereas nationality tend to engender conversations about difference. Mm -hmm. And uh, what about the identity? Identity is, um, well, if we're talking about personal identity, then we're talking about the person. And each individual human being defines his or her identity in different ways. What I'm looking for in my work as a thinker, as a screenwriter, as a novelist, and as a human are, are ways to use language to create commonality, are ways to use language to break down the barriers rather than to fortify the barriers between us versus them. But there's also pleasure uh, about the football games or there is like national pleasures too. Sure. Well, there are um, affiliation pleasures. Well, I'm not a f- football <laughs> sure. fan, but sure, I can see like but some I am. joys in that. I am. Things. I'm a yeah. football fan and I adore. <laughs> we all remember the moment when Ghana beat the United States in the World Cup. We felt as if colonization had been reversed, but it wasn't. At the end of the day, sports are a representation, a healthy representation of what used to be war. I'd rather see two people duking it out on the American or European football fields than anywhere else, certainly than in the streets of Kiev. But at the end of the day, it is a representation of conflict. It is not conflict itself. And so what we are looking for are ways to take down the walls with language, with understanding, with mentality, with perspective that exist or that are erected from one individual and the next between one group of people and another such that actual conflict becomes, if not impossible, then implausible. Yes, I understand. Let's uh, end talking about you. So we said like uh, you're an author, screenwriter, photographer. Uh, You talked about um, Afropolitanism in your essay in 2005, Bye Bye Babar. What was it about? What was your vision about Afropolitanism at the time? And it was a long time ago. So as it evolved since. When I was a child. (laughs) It was my first grade uh, book report. Um, Afropolitanism. So in 2005, I wrote an essay describing um, the identity of a particular group of people, um, one of whom is with us today, Joelle. Hi, Hi, Joelle. I noticed that you are a Kenyan who's speaking Turkish. Yes, I do. Yes, indeed. And so that says to me that you might be a candidate for Afropolitanism. (laughs) (laughs) Um, because since the 1900s have been Africans who have been sent out into the world, not just into the world outside of Africa, but across the continent itself. These Africans, to say simply that Joel is Kenyan or that I'm Nigerian or Ghanaian, yes, that is a huge and indeed the most salient part of our identity, but it is not complete. I was born in England. I was educated in the United States. And back in England, I've lived in Rome, I've lived in Berlin, I've lived in Lisbon. How do we define ourselves? How do we describe who we are? Surely I would happily stop at I'm African. But the reality is many African people themselves would say, well, you don't live in Ghana or Nigeria. And so how does that African define him or herself? To to them, I offer the notion of Afropolitans. It's a tendency to um, oversimplify To oversimplify. Things. Yes. To the tendency to oversimplify or rather resisting the tendency to oversimplify, the very human, the very global tendency to oversimplify is my life's work. Oh, great. I was about to ask you, what's the coherence in everything uh, you're writing? That's it. You already found it. Uh, Thank you. I've been looking for it for all these years. (laughs) And here you are. I found it. What's the next book, the the next project? Yeah. Um, At the moment, I've uh, made a kind of lateral move from fiction into television. one of the things that I think most people have noticed in in the golden age of television is that a novel is very similar to a series in structure. And so I found myself in my lifelong pursuit um, 
of an end to oversimplification, uh, working on um, five different television shows, most of them to do in some way with the African continent, um, but none of them simple in any way. Yeah, I, I was about to. <laughs> I had no doubt about that. <laughs> What's the most precious advice you've been given? There is no audience. Um, when I first went to India, I've, I've been many times since, I was working with a, um, a yoga instructor and he shared this piece of wisdom from Hindu belief. There is no audience, meaning you live your, we live our lives, you live your life as if you were on a stage, as if someone is watching, but no one is watching. No one is watching. If you do a good deed, you do it for you, not because there's an audience. If you make a mistake, You seek to repair it for yourself, not because there's an audience. If you harm somebody, you apologize, not because there's an audience, not because somebody's watching, but because it edifies you, because it is the right thing to do, because it is the generous, it is the gracious, it is the good thing to do. There is no audience has been a piece of advice that's changed my life. That's wonderful. Is it a way also to... Um protect you because you're exposed as a public figure? No, because the person who told me there is no audience did not say there is no stage. I, um, right now, I've stepped onto your circular rug with this, um, is it real? Yeah. Okay, with this little <laughs> plant. We're on a stage. We're having a conversation for a non-present audience um, of viewers, and I know that. But, but what it really means is, is that for my existence, for my very existence, okay. for my day-to-day, -day, on a you know, spiritual and um, fundamental level, I do not perform my life. I live it. Gives you more freedom? Gives me more responsibility. Uh, I will end with um, last question. This is uh, the great harvest of the day, something I'm asking to all the guests uh, on this podcast. Mm. If something uh, could be done easily or simply, uh, easy or simple, that could change the world, what would it be for you, Tai? If one thing could be done that was both easy and simple or, and would change the world, yes, e what could it be? Easy or simple. You don't have to, to, do, to put an end. It doesn't have to be easy and I simple. I don't think there's an easy way to change the world. I think if there were um, human beings far more intelligent than I would have found it by now. I have infinite faith in humanity, like Terence, I, I say, I am human, nothing human is alien to me, but um, simple. Talk to people you don't know. Find somebody who feels like them, who feels the most like them. Tap into your deepest sense of us. Identify someone who feels deeply so them and talk to them. Thank you, Tay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Merci bien. Merci. <laughs>